And we're back. I've been asked two times by ND Spencer 07 to cover HH Homes, so I wanted to do that. However, completing this request had a little bit of a problem attached to it because I had never heard of HH Homes, which is very unique for me. So I had to do a whole bunch of research for this. However, because it happened in 1880 through like 1896, there's not a lot of information on it and there's a whole lot of misinformation because he lied a whole bunch and a lot of people who believe this lie but don't believe this lie. So this video is what I've been able to piece together from my research over the last two days. H.H. Holmes was born in 1960 in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. According to him, he had a pretty normal childhood, normal parents, normal school life, but he was psychopathic. Therefore, statistically speaking, he probably got into some amount of trouble while he was growing up. The only trouble that is documented is the fact that he was really, really smart. Therefore, he was really great in school and other kids were resentful of that. So they did bully him quite severely all through school, but there's one event that actually stands out. Some of the kids dragged him into a doctor's office to show him a full standing skeleton with the intent of scaring him. However, instead of being scared, he was completely fascinated. And this one event is what he credits with his absolute fascination with skeletons and dead bodies. For college, he went off to the University of Michigan Medical School. He graduated in 1884. Although while he was at school, he did have a bunch of scams going on, including supplying some people with cadavers so they could cash in on insurance fraud and other crazy things like that, always having to do with the dead bodies. And for the next two years, he kind of just skirted around the United States committing insurance fraud, as well as being a teacher, a pharmacist, a doctor, Doctor and an asylum clerk. In 1886, he arrived in Chicago and because he didn't want any sort of association with anything that had come before in his life, he decided to change his name to Henry Howard Holmes, or H.H. H. Holmes. And under that name, he had no medical training, but he did present papers that showed that he was a doctor, all false paperwork, of course. Very shortly after arriving, he was able to secure a job at a pharmacy. A few weeks after they gave him the job, Everett, the pharmacy owner, who was already a little bit sick, seemed to die of natural causes. And a few months later, his wife, Claire, quickly signed the pharmacy over to Holmes and then apparently moved out to California, though she was never actually heard from again. Under his management, the business thrived and very soon he had the money to build the hotel that he'd always wanted. To build this hotel, he drew out plans and was the building's own architect. He would hire people in succession and someone would come in, build half of a room, and then he would say, this is totally crappy, shoddy work, get rid of them, because if it was shoddy work, then he wouldn't have to pay them. Then he'd bring in somebody else who would build the other half of the room and then he'd fire them immediately. This guaranteeing that one, he never actually had to pay anybody for any of the work that they did. And two, no one knew the full purpose of the building except for him. And it was such a huge building of a pillar of the community in Chicago that they called it Holmes Castle. In the castle, the third floor was just a regular old floor. Holmes lived up there as well as some of the other guests. It was the second floor that began the idea that the rest of the floors may not be so normal. There were about 35 rooms. Some of them were normal rooms. Some of them were laboratories. Some of them were airtight gas chambers. There were chutes in the walls so that if he had killed some Somebody, you could just grab them, throw them down in a quick shoot, they'd go down to the basement so that if they were still alive, he could torture them down there, or if they were dead, he could dismember them. And since the hotel was created just in time for the Chicago World Fair, which saw thousands of people coming into town on their own, young women and young men, and people who really had no way of contacting home if anything went wrong, they really wanted to see all these new inventions that would be a part of the 20th century that were here today. Hotel rooms were incredibly scarce, but now there's a this whole huge new hotel to stay in, which was Holmes Castle. Nobody really ever noticed the fact that a lot of people were going missing because people who were staying there were people who were transient. They weren't living in Chicago. There was no one around to sort of notice that they gone missing today and the people in the hometown didn't really know where they were staying or where to begin looking so it was just kind of a dead end. Meanwhile Holmes having already killed them or tortured them to death would have stripped their bones, cleaned them off, and then sold their bones to local medical centers. You know if you walk into a doctor's office there's always that like skeleton in the corner which is either plastic or is a real person who donated their body to science. I can't understand however why nobody asked why a guy who has like the local drugstore and a hotel suddenly has a whole bunch of bones to sell. People just bought them and didn't even think anything of it because he was so well to do and he's such a pillar of the community. That blows my mind. He came across a friend named Benjamin Pitzel. was a really great guy who was trying to provide for his several children and his wife. However, he had always had bad luck. He kind of attempted scams in the hopes of being able to provide for his family and always failed at it. So moving into Holmes Castle, he made friends with Holmes and became an employee of the building and kind of helped him out in the daily dealings and he helped him out with the accounting books and he helped him out with cleaning 
cleaning out the building and he was just a really great partner in business for Holmes. It was about 1893 when Pitzel went to Holmes and said, I'm still not making enough money. I don't know what to do. And Holmes said, let's try an insurance scam. We're gonna take out a huge insurance plan on your life and then you are gonna simply disappear. I can get a hold of a cadaver and I will disfigure it so it sort of looks a little bit like you. And if you can get your wife involved, then she can go identify your body. They'll pay out the money and give it to her and then you guys will have all the money you need. Pitzel thought it was an absolutely great idea so they decided to do it in Philadelphia. And then they spent the next several months months running around the country scamming people and stealing things just seemingly for fun. It was by 1894 that Holmes attempted to go to another drugstore and scam those people out of their drugstore. Only this time it didn't work and he was put in jail. His cellmate in jail was Marion Hedgepeth who was a very dangerous bank robber. For some reason Holmes decided to share his real plan for Peitzel's insurance scam which was that he was going to kill Peitzel, have the wife identify the body as Peitzel's and then collect the money himself somehow but he couldn't figure out how he would get the money from her to him so he said he would somehow have to require a crooked lawyer who would allow that to happen and Hedgepath knew a crooked lawyer who would definitely get the money for him and he said you know what I will give him your number if you give me some of the money that you're gonna get from this insurance scam he said sure I'll give you $500 if you give me this guy's number so he gave him the information and then shortly thereafter Holmes's brand new wife bailed him out of jail and then shortly thereafter the charges were dropped anyway now that Holmes is once again out breathing for free air. Him and Peitzel went off to Philadelphia to complete the insurance scam. Shortly after they arrived, Holmes killed Peitzel. Once the body was found, he went to contact the wife to do her part in this scam. However, almost all of her children were sick at the exact same time, so she sent her 15-year-old daughter with Holmes, who had been essentially her uncle for the past eight years of her life, to go identify the body. As soon as he went and identified the body, he then came back to Mrs. Peitzel, astonishingly without the girl, though she was still alive. He, however, told Mrs. Peitzel that she was with her father and that they were waiting for the rest of them to come. So she packed everybody up and she was like, all right, let's go. And then Holmes said, you know what? You traveling with all these kids might seem really, really conspicuous. You know, if you're committing scams, you don't want to draw attention to yourself. So I'll take two of them. She said, okay. Over the course of them moving from Chicago to Philadelphia, however, Holmes did in fact kill the children, seeing as he never actually had any use for them other than the glee he got from seeing that they were separate from their mom and identifying the body. And both those things were kind of used up. So while Mrs. Peitzel went to Philadelphia to meet up with her husband and her kids that she still believed were alive, Holmes continued on to Boston. However, this is when his plan went awry. Because back in his old cell, Marion Hedgepath had seen that this man had died and he sat around waiting before his five dollars and it never came. He contacted the Pinkerton detectives, who were the most famous detectives in the United States who could track somebody from one side of the country to the other and always got their man. And they were able to track him to Boston where they had him arrested for insurance fraud. But along their tracking they realized that he should have three kids with him but the kids weren't there. And if they're missing then what happened with Peitzel? And if that's happening then what happened way back in Chicago? While they were traveling east in hopes of meeting up with their father, Alice the 15 year old girl was writing letters to her mom saying oh we're in this city now, we're in this city now, and asked Holmes to send every single one. He didn't send a single one, so he just kind of had them in his possession. However, after he was arrested, one of those detectives took the letters and tracked back exactly where they were and was able to find the bodies of the three children and return them to their mother for burial. Police went to Chicago and searched the entire building, and that's when they found they had torture chambers in there and multiple ways to kill people and strip bodies. And that's where the rumors have come from that he killed more than 200 people because he had this factory where he could just do it in such a quick efficient way and since his hotel was pretty much always full he had his pick of victims. Though that statement has never been substantiated there is no way to substantiate because the science of the times did not have forensics they did not have the ability to look at a bone and say that's definitely human or to look at the DNA of something and say okay well your missing family member is here and they were inundated with people saying you know my daughter went missing in Chicago during these years when you're saying he was active do you think that she's there? They had absolutely no way of telling so they have no way of knowing how many people were thrown in the lime bath so how many people were cremated they have no idea how many bones were sold off so they have no way of knowing whether or not he actually killed anybody in that place after the police vacated the castle there were a lot of people who wanted to visit it as this sort of like tourist attraction this hall of death someone began getting the place ready to be a great tourist attraction when all of a sudden one night before it could open someone burned the place to the ground chicago and philadelphia fought for whoever was going to get the opportunity to try him first. Philadelphia won because they actually had a case. They had the case of the insurance fraud and all the paperwork to prove it. So they went after him for insurance fraud and murder of Benjamin Peitzel. Without a problem, he 
confessed the insurance fraud. But he was like, no, he totally uh, committed suicide. That had nothing to do with me. But it literally didn't make sense. That was the basis of the trial. Did he commit suicide or did he have to be murdered? And seeing as Holmes had already made the statement that he was there that day with Peitzel, there was no other way to look at it than if he had to have been murdered, you by your own words were the only other person there. Therefore, you killed him. And for that, he was sentenced to death and was hanged on May 6, 1896. However, before that, he was given a sum of $10,000 to officially confess to the crimes. He wrote down a very, very long, thorough explanation of 27 murders that he said he committed in the most detailed, disgusting terms he possibly could. Edwin believed that this was his final words, and he believed that he didn't have anything to hide anymore. He was going to die anyway, so he might as well come out with it. And then at the gallows, when they put the noose around his neck, he said, do you have any last words? He says, oh, that whole thing I wrote for the $10,000, it was all fake. He wanted to continue with his wording, but they just pulled the hood over his head and dropped him. It took him almost 15 minutes of struggling before he died. For a person like this, there's really no question of why he just wanted to do it and therefore he did it. There's no anger. He just thoroughly enjoyed hurting and killing people. Although there were a lot of people who did think that the reason why he did this is because he was being guided by Satan and this was kind of backed up by the fact that there were a lot of weird deaths after he died as well as a fire at the DA's office which burned everything in there except for one small picture of H.H. Holmes. Totally weird but he was definitely not guided by the devil. He was just a psychopath. He was never actually formally charged or tried in Chicago. He died before then. Do you think that was a proper course? Do you think that since he was just getting the death penalty in Philadelphia and that's totally good and they just went ahead with that and that's awesome as long as he's dead? Or do you think that they should have sought justice for some of the people that they could prove in Chicago? Put your answers down below. If you try to search for H.H. Holmes you'll get a whole lot of references of Leonardo DiCaprio because while Tom Cruise initially bought the rights for the book The Devil of the Windy City, it's now owned by Leonardo DiCaprio. So there will eventually be a movie about H.H. H. Holmes starring Leonardo DiCaprio. I've also found a documentary on Hulu. The link will be below. But despite the fact that how many people he killed, despite the fact that he was a horribly monstrous killer and was known worldwide for it, there's not a whole lot of information that can actually be found about him. It seems that he committed his crimes, he was killed, and then very shortly after he was forgotten. There are several things that are said in the documentary that are not actually true. So if you want to watch a documentary, make sure you're also reading like a true.tv recount of it. Because they have more of the facts that are more well-renowned as being actual facts about him rather than things that they're just kind of speculating on, which they kind of take license with in the documentary. So if you want to see that, link's in the description. I absolutely love you guys. My scoops are beautiful. Please remember to like, favorite, and subscribe. I'm trying to end this video as fast as possible because I can tell it's going to be long even before I begin editing. So I'm so sorry for the length, but I promise to make the next one a short one. I absolutely love you guys. My scoops are beautiful, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.